सेव किया था ना मैं सिर्फ इसलिए गया था क्योंकि उसने मुझे कॉल किया दैट्स इट बट लिसन तो सेव इट फॉर समवन एल्स जिंदगी में सेव करना जरूरी है मगर जब बात पैसों की हो सिर्फ सेविंग से काम नहीं चलेगा इक्विटी म्यूचुअल फंड्स में इन्वेस्ट कीजिए और अपने सेविंग्स को आगे बढ़ने का मौका दीजिए म्यूचुअल फंड इन्वेस्टमेंट्स आर सब्जेक्ट टू मार्केट रिस्क रीड ऑल स्कीम रिलेटेड डॉक्यूमेंट्स केयरफुलरल कॉटर्ज ऑफ द श्रीनगर क्लेरिक मीरवाइज मोहम्मद फारूक fruit carts were used to evacuate the injured through the narrow lanes of the old city 50 people were killed and hundreds were injured the central reserve police force opened fire on the procession jammu and kashmir's human rights commission recorded decades later it was never properly investigated and no one was prosecuted father to the secessionist politician malvi umar farooq the mirwais was a key figure in the making of kashmir's anti india islamist movement he was killed when jihadists learned of his secret efforts to make peace with the indian government finally the mirwais was laid to rest at what is now known locally as the mazar e shahada a martyrs graveyard in shrinagar four weeks later the jihadist who killed him mohammad abdullah bangru was shot dead by police a procession assembled again to take him to the graveyard and he was laid right next to the mirwais both were martyrs in the minds of their supporters and martyrs for exactly the same cause and the story should have ended there but it didn't earlier this week police in kashmir arrested two of the men alleged to have been involved in the assassination of the mirwais in may 1990 a single killing that ignited the massacre i just told you about and thousands of other murders in the decades that followed it for decades the alleged fugitives javed bhat and zahur bhat had been living in plain sight in shrinagar following the assassination zahur a 1974 born eighth grade school dropout who worked for a time as a car mechanic before the jihad began fled to kathmandu then in 2007 he returned to shrinagar and began living at home again after a few weeks in jail like zahur javed who had also joined a jihad training camp in pakistan soon after finishing high school left for nepal after the assassination then he returned home in 2003 to live in the solina neighborhood in shrinagar kashmir police sources have told the print that the intelligence services were aware of the return of the two men but hoped to operate them as assets against the hezbollah mujahideen instead of pushing forward with prosecution two of the key suspects hezbollah mujahideen commander abdullah bangru and his deputy abdul rahman shigar had been killed in an encounter in the 1990s a third member of the cell mohammad ayub dar was convicted in a case that went all the way up to the supreme court and finally settled only in 2010 but there's a deeper story about why it's important today that we not forget the background like the havel massacre the killers of the mirwais were subjected to a kind of willful official amnesia from early in the last century the armies of the sher and the bakra the sher a reference to sheikh mohammad abdullah's favored honorific the lion of kashmir and the second to the goat like beards of the pious supporters of the mirwais had battled for control of shrinagar streets the dogra monarch maharaja hari singh had allied with mirwais yusuf shah who then controlled the jamia masjid in shrinagar the maharaja hoped to use the malvi to push back against a new generation of educated nationalist politicians battling his regime even as the two sides accused each other of collaborationism and even heresy they often made common cause to contain the influence of the indian state in kashmir following the disappearance of a revered religious relic from the hazrat bal shrine in 1963 for example the two sides joined to exert pressure on new delhi as mobs attacked properties owned by then chief minister gulam mohammad bakshi's family and the state government completely disintegrated 
scholar Navneeta Behra has recorded that the two leaders ran, and I quote, an unauthorized parallel administration controlling traffic, prices and commerce. From his pulpit, Mirwais Farooq, not the current one but his father, made thinly veiled pleas for Pakistani victory in the build-up to the 1965 war. The members of the two factions even boycotted marriages, funerals and religious ceremonies hosted by families of Muslim members of the Congress party. Later, in 1983, former Chief Minister Farooq Abdullah allied with Mirwais Mohammad Farooq in an election campaign marred by ugly communal invective. Although the alliance helped Abdullah beat off competition from the jamaat e islami in Kashmir, while the Congress decimated the Bharatiya Janta Party's then avatar in Jammu, the ethnic religious fault lines in the state deepened significantly. The rise of jihadist groups after 1989 threatened both the clerical establishment in Srinagar and the Jammu and Kashmir National Conference. Again, both sides began working to tamp down the crisis. Mirwais Mohammad Farooq publicly condemned Jammu and Kashmir Liberation Front terrorists for kidnapping former Chief Minister Mufti Mohammad Saeed's daughter, Rubia Saeed. Later, scholar Balraj Puri was to reveal he began reaching out to intermediaries in New Delhi, including former Defence Minister George Fernandez. Fearing the Mirwais would cut a deal with Delhi and undermine the jihadists, the Central Bureau of Investigation would later determine, the jamaat e islami and Hizbul Mujahideen ordered his assassination in April 1990. Tens of thousands of lives, obviously, would be claimed by the ensuing collapse of political peacemaking efforts. The Mirwais's murder also haunted future efforts to negotiate peace. From 1998 onwards, the secessionist leader Mirwais Umar Farooq, the current Mirwais, and Abdul Ghani Lone began a fresh effort to try and end the violence. In a secret meeting with leaders in Pakistan three years later, the scholar Lawrence Lifshutz records, Lone implored jihadists, I quote, to leave us alone. Their presence is detrimental to our struggle, Lone explained to his Pakistani interlocutors, especially because they have initiated an international jihadist agenda. Lone also lobbied the inter-services intelligence chief Ehsanul Haq to back a dialogue process in Kashmir. At the 2001 remembrance of the assassination of Umar Farooq's father, that is Mohammad Farooq, armed men gathered around the rostrum and shouted Lone down. Haat mein haat do, lashkar kush saat do, they cried, walk hand in hand with the lashkar e taiba. Huriyat mein rehna hoga, to Pakistan kehna hoga, was the slogan of the armed men. Those who want to stay in the Huriyat must support Pakistan. Lone, however, to his credit, refused to cave in. Enabled by inten- intelligence services, and with the support of Prime Minister Atal Bihari Vajpayee, the peace process succeeded eventually in persuading key leaders of the Hezbollah Mujahideen to accept a ceasefire. The ceasefire collapsed though, but Lone was instrumental in efforts to revive it. In a signed 2002 article, Hezbollah Mujahideen Deputy Commander-in-Chief Abdul Ahmad Bhatt promised that a peace process would lead his cadre, and I quote, to at once give up guns and observe a real ceasefire. Would it have worked? Who knows? But Lone was shot dead within days of that editorial, just as Muhammad Mirwais Farooq was before him. In neither case have the families of the slain politicians even today publicly identified their murderers. Lone's alleged assassin, Rafiq Lidri, killed in an encounter was also buried in the mazar e <laughs> That funeral was attended by Mirwais Omar Farooq. Lies have long lain at the heart of the Kashmir secessionist movement. Few of its leaders have been willing to summon the courage to blame jihadist groups and their sponsors in Pakistan for their crimes. But the Indian state also needs to look inward. The government's failure to ensure justice for victims of violence 
and its own long record of misjudgments and opportunism have enabled secessionists to build up politics on a bed of deceit. Ensuring the truth is at least now told will be critical to securing the hard-won but fragile peace in Jammu and Kashmir. I'm Praveen Swami and I'm National Security Editor of The Print. Thank you once again for listening to Security Code.